thing about being an ecologist, and we've kind of touched on it here, one thing about being an ecologist is you are on the forefront, because you guys are, are going to be representing ecologists, you are on the forefront for seeing what happens to a system as things change. As development increases, as populations increase, as the amount of concrete goes up and the amount of plant matter goes down, you are going to be the one to see what happens. As a result, ecologists get to be the ones that turn into environmentalists. This is, um, this is a lecture that I gave in West Texas. And I got to explain to my students in West Texas who are, I don't know if they're, are they more conservative? But here, they're pretty darn conservative. What an environmentalist is. An environmentalist is an advocate for the protection and preservation of the natural environment. They're the ones that, that are being responsible. They're saying, uh, there's a problem, and this is what the problem is. It is up to society to solve the problem. But we're being responsible to tell you, this is what the problem is. And that's what ecologists do. But here's the big, the big <coughs> asterisk. This is based on science. To be an, a responsible advocate, you base it on science. You don't base it on hyperbole. Mm -hmm. Albert Leopold. He was the. He shot wolves in New Mexico, for crying out loud, but then he came back and said, hold it. <laughs> the, the system's not working if we try to control everything. We can't control and take out what we consider bad and just leave what we consider good. The system doesn't work that way. And so he was one of the first ones to say, uh, we need to keep all of the parts. We need to keep all the parts to keep the system healthy. And by the way, Rachel Carson in Silent Spring, she was a U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service employee, and um, she was pretty much vilified for, for coming out and saying, let me back up, coming out and saying that the, the use of the highly persistent insecticides were killing insects and accumulating in the environment to the detriment of, of the environment is really what she said. The Silent Spring referred to, if you don't already know, referred to the loss of songbirds uh, due to the thinning of the eggshells because of the buildup of DDT left uh, the inability to absorb calcium and thus the inability to produce strong eggshells. One thing, one note, um, I will tell you that I was a, I worked at Texas Tech for eight years as a consultant to the EPA on pesticides. And one thing that many people don't know is that DDT is not that toxic. DDT has a low toxicity. DDT is not cancer, is not a carcinogen to humans. Everyone's like, DDT is all. It's not that toxic. The bad part of DDT is it is persistent in the environment and it builds up. And it moves through the food chain and as it moves through the food chain it bioaccumulates. That's the bad part of DPT. It's not that toxic. Well, it was also used in such humongous quantities. Yeah. I mean, even when I went to school, we were dusted. And that's the point. Yeah. And that's the point. It's, it is pervasive in the environment. Yeah, Gary? A couple of years before Rachel Collerson uh, published her book, a professor at Davis wrote a book. <clears throat> he was a, zo a zoology professor there, wrote a book like hers, but actually had more data and the regents at the university stopped <clears throat> to not allow them to publish it. That, see, that's the hard part about being an ecologist. Um, you are kind of setting yourself up for heartbreak, almost. Because you... It, it broke them. It, it, it broke them. Yeah, it, it, my, my husband's a biologist. Um, uh, you know too much and it sets you up. All right. So Aldo Leopold really wrote the book on how to manage wildlife, and he, right before he died, and he died of a heart attack helping uh, his neighbors fight a, um, a prescribed fire that got away from them. Um, but he wrote the San County Almanac, and it had just been approved for publication when he passed away. You may know that already, but 
that was where he really got reflective about what we were doing to our, to our own environment. It, it, it comes, I, I see it time and time again, it comes around that you, as, as a scientist and as a biologist, um, you see a much bigger picture the further, the longer you go, and it, uh, it changes you. Okay. Changing direction. It all starts with energy. This is just like Watergate. We're not following the money, we're following the energy. And my students never understood that analogy. <laughs> never mind. Okay. All right. You need to understand that energy flows through a system. It is a one-way path. Energy flows through a system, one-way path. It is transferred from, <coughs> from level to level, and it is, well, let's start with this one. This is a good, this is a good one to know. Um, laws of thermodynamics. cannot be created or destroyed. Only transferred. Energy cannot be created or destroyed, only transferred. And we'll talk about the source of energy in our system. The second law of thermodynamics is no transfer of energy is ever 100% uh, efficient. No transfer of energy is ever 100% <coughs> efficient. Ken, you like cars. Great. Ken? Yeah, I'm, yes, I do. All right. <laughs> the most efficient car in the world is probably a BMW. Would you agree? German engineering? <laughs> What's the most efficient car in the world? Not Tesla. Mercedes. Okay. <laughs> What percent efficiency from the burning of the fuel in the most efficient car in the world to the momentum of the car did you say there is? What percentage of the total energy is actually used to propel the car? 15%. Less than 15%. I would say 15%. The, the most efficient vehicle in the world runs at about 38% efficiency. So burning the fuel to forward momentum of the car, about 38% efficiency. That's pretty good. Where does most of the energy go? Heat. 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 If you were to remove the radiator of the car, what would happen to the to the functioning of the vehicle? That happened to me once. <laughs> burn up. It frees up. It burn up. Yeah. 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 Mercedes would tell you. It'd be like. Put the radiator back. <clears throat> so most of the energy in a system is not, is, you, you can't destroy energy, but you can transfer it into a different form. When you have a transfer of energy between, for example, say, grass to a grazer, <coughs> all of the energy from the grass is directly transferred into the tissues of the grazer. Most of that energy is going to be lost in the form of heat. heat. Heat is a form of energy. If you have not destroyed the energy, it is a form of energy, but it is a highly inefficient form of energy. Wouldn't it be neat if you could get like a butterfly net and run around and catch heat? Catch it, catch it, catch it, catch it, and kind of push it down into like your car tank. And so your car could, it's a, it's a form of energy. Wouldn't that be nice if you could do that? Can't. So we, to understand a system, you need to understand the flow and that's an operative word, the flow of energy. Okay, so what is the ultimate source of life energy? Sun. sun. So what's happening in the sun to generate the energy? Oh, Karen, you this one. 
<laughs> fusion. Fusion. Okay, so we have atomic fusion. Atomic fusion is so much better than atomic fission because you get hydrogen and helium crashing together and fusing. It makes so much more energy. Wouldn't that be fun if we could have like a console lab to do atomic fusion? Write <laughs> <laughs> a grant. Write a grant. <laughs> that would be fun. We can get some serious energy out of that one. So atomic fusion releases huge amounts of radiation, some of which get through our atmosphere, which the ingenious pigments of the plant are able to transfer into the bonds of glucose. Energy is transferred in the system. Solar radiation. And everyone should know this, from atomic fusion, in the sun. So it's basically, you know, a whole bunch of bombs going off, and that energy is coming in, and we're using it. It's transferred. That's two hours. To chemical bonds. in plants. So the organisms that are capable of taking that energy and transferring it, there's the transfer again, transferring it into chemical energy are called producers. Let's try this one. There we go. Okay, so there's our, our pyramid of energy with the sun as our source of energy. At the base of our pyramid, notice that the base is the widest at the bottom because that has the most amount of energy. The plants are always going to be the, the uh, sites, the carriers of the most amount of energy in the system. So as we go up through our system, Notice we start at 1,000 units of energy at the base. Then we have our organisms that feed on them, the consumers. And here we have grasshoppers. The difference between plants and grasshoppers, yeah. we have started with 1,000 units of energy, we went to 100 units of energy. And not a very efficient transfer of energy. Then from the grasshoppers to the frog, we went from 100 to 10. And then from the frog to the upper level consumers. Notice that we have the upper level consumers, snakes, fox, predators. They just get one one thousand of the original amount of energy. Again, this is in prairie dogs. Let's say we wipe out all of the producers. We go in, oh, here we go. My whiteboard, I can do that. I can wipe out. All right, so all the producers are gone. What happens? The whole system falls down. The whole system falls down. Another way of seeing it. Okay, so in order to have top level consumers, not only do you, okay, to have 10 snakes, because we like snakes, to have 10 snakes we need to have 100 frogs and 1,000 grasshoppers and 10,000 blades of grass. If we were to have just one, we still needed 10 frogs, 100 grasshoppers, and 1,000 blades of grass. 